Jerry Costner and his wife Mimi waited in the far room of a psychologist therapist for the first of six scheduled therapy sessions. The therapy was ordered by a judge in their divorce case. They didn't look at each other or talk. The young receptionist was used to such cold wars. She had only worked for Dr. Nellie Bly for ten months. She had noticed some patterns in these situations. Dr. Bly observed the interaction, or lack thereof, from her office on a closed loop system. She was interested in observing what spouses did once they were in the same room for the first session. In this case, she saw that neither spouse wanted anything to do with the other. This was somewhat unusual. Most of the time, one of them would apologize and try to initiate some sort of contact, even if only in the form of a nod or a frown. These two were studiously and completely ignoring each other. It wasn't a good thing, but she wasn't tasked with gluing the marriage together. Rather, she had to assess the situation to see if it could be salvaged. If at any point she concluded that further pursuits were futile, she could tell the judge, and he would subpoena the parties again. After ten agonizing minutes, agonizing for them, not for her, she opened the door and invited them into her office. The office had a small desk where Nellie sat, and two less than comfortable chairs for the couple. When everyone was seated, Dr. Bly began with her standard opening speech. She told them that the purpose of the sessions was to assess in an even tone of voice whether their union could continue, albeit under changed circumstances. She said these sessions are often scheduled in situations like theirs involving minor children. Nellie outlined her preferences. She began by recounting what she had learned from court documents. Then each of them would talk briefly about what, if any, goals they had for these meetings. This could be followed by a discussion. The session was held every week for ten weeks or less. After each session, participants were required to write a summary of the session and evaluate progress, or lack of progress. So I'll begin. I understand Jerry works for a real estate firm, selling homes and commercial properties. You and Mimi have two children in junior high school, George and Winfred, ages 13 and 12. You are each 35 years old. You met in college and married shortly after graduation. Mimi was a homemaker until six years ago when she started working as a teacher at a private high school near here. On Saturday, six weeks ago, the two of you went to a picnic organized by Mimi's school for staff and parents. At this event, Mimi went to a secluded location with the school's physical education teacher, Blake Drake. Mimi and Mr. Drake did not leave together, but Jerry became suspicious because of some of the interactions he had observed earlier that day. Jerry knew the park well. He correctly assumed that if Mimi and Drake were going to have sexual intercourse, they would do it near the barn at the back of the park because it was secluded and there was no risk of anyone looking in. However, Jerry asked his friend Brenda, a neighbor who also worked at the school, to accompany him when he went to check on Mimi. He asked Brenda to have her cell phone camera ready. They walked over to a spot where they could see what was going on behind the barn. Mimi and Mr. Drake were together behind the barn. Brenda videotaped them hugging and kissing. Jerry came over and yelled at them. His words were rude. Mimi and Drake separated. Mimi fixed the top of her dress and apologized to Jerry. Jerry berated her and called Drake an asshole. Drake was a bigger man than Jerry. He took offense, called Jerry a wuss, and headed toward him in a threatening manner. Jerry backed away from Drake, who kept advancing and punched Jerry with his fist. Jerry then threw several punches at Drake, including a hard kick to his groin area. Drake lost consciousness. Jerry called for an ambulance. Police and medical assistants arrived. A crowd gathered. Drake was taken to the hospital. He was released the next day. The police were about to arrest Jerry when Brenda showed them the video. They refused to act. Jerry and Brenda left the picnic, leaving Mimi there. The next week, Jerry filed for divorce, claiming infidelity and incompatibility. Mimi contested the divorce, claiming she had not had sexual relations with Drake. Jerry filed the video as an exhibit in the divorce. I watched it. Jerry, why did you file for divorce so quickly? Have you had a chance to talk to Mimi about her behavior? I don't think talking would help the case. She cheated. We agreed before we were married that it would never happen. It was a long and tense discussion then. We wrote it all down and signed it. I have a copy if you need it. There's no need for it now. Mimi, what led to the scene at the picnic? I was infatuated with Blake. He was hired at the beginning of the school year. 
He's big and handsome, and he was paying attention to me, flattering me. It swayed me. I've gained extra weight since we got married. I felt insecure about it, and I thought I wasn't attracted to Jerry anymore. Was that the first time you had sexual contact? Because I think it was very risky, given the circumstances. We only went so far that day. We kissed and cuddled without taking off our clothes. Mimi, why did you contest the divorce? Why do you believe your marriage can be saved? I believe that if given time, we can go back to the way things used to be. Maybe not all the way back yet. I made a mistake with Blake. I crossed some boundaries, but I never had meaningful sex with him. Jerry picked up on that. But she would have crossed them if I hadn't violated them. Really, Mimi? Nellie didn't ask the question in a confrontational manner. Maybe. I didn't think it would go this far. We were on the street, but we got carried away. I can't tell you how far it might have gone. Jerry turned to her again. Even if you hadn't done it there, you would have fucked him eventually. Jerry turned to Nellie. After I whipped him, Mimi came home with her friend and wanted to go to the hospital to see Drake. She said she felt sorry for him. Nellie asked Mimi, if you hadn't been discovered, would you have had full-on sex with him? Yes, yes, I would have. She'd still do it now, I think. Jerry was bitter. Nellie asked, Mimi, is it true that you could have sex with Drake even if you were exposed? Well, I don't have the same attitude about sex and fidelity that Jerry does. That was one of the things we discussed before we got married. We agreed to be faithful. But there was also a clause in the agreement that fidelity could be renegotiated if one partner made a serious request. I insisted on that. So I'm still drawn to Blake. I'd like to take advantage of the renegotiation clause. Then your answer is yes. Do you want extramarital sexual relations with Drake? Yes. You think you could have that and still be married to Jerry? His attitude seems to be different from yours? If he's reasonable. I wouldn't see Drake or anyone else very often. It wouldn't interfere with the marriage. Jerry and I would have the same sex we used to have. And what if Jerry denies your request? I don't know. I hope he'll allow it. Jerry? Under no circumstances will I agree to her having sex with anyone else, male or female. She promised she wouldn't. If she does, we'll divorce. In fact, a simple statement that she wants to be free of what she promised is enough. The divorce has already begun. If she gives up her desire for other men now, I will never believe her. She'll just be prevaricating. Mimi, what do you say to that? Has Jerry lost confidence in you? I would have cheated. I wanted something that I knew would hurt Jerry. I didn't want to hurt Jerry, so I didn't tell him. Well, he caught me. Now I'm telling him. Nellie asked, is that a take it or leave it proposition? Yes. Well, maybe it is. I, uh, I'm confused. I feel like I'm being reasonable and he's not. I love him, but if he loved me, he wouldn't waste a few days on someone else. Jerry, why isn't she right that you won't suffer? What if she treats you exactly the same way she did before? Why would you have to end the marriage and destroy your family over this? She made me a promise. It was a promise that she wouldn't have sex with other people. It wasn't just a recitation of wedding vows. We had a serious talk and she agreed. She knew it was important to me. That was the deciding factor. If she hadn't agreed, we wouldn't have gotten married at all. It's important because I want to live with a wife who puts me before other men. If she's sneaking around and sleeping with other guys, then she's doing it because she feels better in bed with them. I just can't stand the thought that she would have an intimate relationship with another man, especially with a weak asshole like Drake. A weak asshole. Mimi, do you want other guys because you believe they'll be better in bed? Yes, maybe not for a long time, but as a new experience, yes. Jerry said, that's it. What if I meet a woman who I think will give me better sex than Mimi? Will I be able to fuck her just because I want to? Nellie turned to Mimi. You want an open marriage where he can date other women and have sex with them? Eh, I don't understand why he needs another when he can have me whenever he wants. So why is it okay for you, but not for him? Guys can't get turned on, but women can have multiple partners. Oh, that's stupid. You're making me look stupid. He can sleep with whoever he wants. Jerry, do you want an open marriage? No, I want a faithful wife. 
I don't have one. I'll get rid of her and try to find another one. What about the kids? Asked Mimi. They'll be hurt. You're the one hurting them. I'm not. You want another man for the thrill of it. That's what's ruining the family, not me. Nellie waved her hand soothingly. It looks like we've reached an impasse. Mimi, what do you hope for as a result of this counseling? I want my life back and I want some freedom. Jerry, I want a divorce. I want my children with me. I don't need her. She's gone. Nellie said, I think we now have a full understanding of the situation. I would like each of you to write to me with your ideas of what might save the situation. I think you are both worried about your children and their reactions. The couple left the office. Jerry, seeing that Mimi had pressed the elevator button, took the stairs, but they still lived in the same house. Jerry moved his things to the basement where the bathroom and shower were. There, he had a cot and a TV. Mimi lived in the master bedroom and the kids had their own rooms. They knew about the discord. How could they miss it? But it had been going on for a few weeks now, and they had gotten used to the new routine. At the next session, a week after the first, Nellie asked each of them to read out their written suggestions for what might save the situation. Mimi wrote that if Jerry agreed to allow her to date once a month, they could resume their marriage. She stated that sex dates once a month would not affect Jerry's privileges as her husband in any way. She would still perform the same household duties, including cooking. As far as Jerry could tell, the marriage wouldn't change a bit. She had agreed that her liaisons would be very discreet so that none of their friends would find out about her antics. Jerry? No way. Jerry's statement simply said that after his wife suggested that she should be able to break her promise and demonstrated that she would prank and lie, he saw no way to save the marriage. Nellie says, what if she promised not to have other men and then signed an agreement that if she cheated, she would give up her half in the divorce? Would that dispel your doubts? Well, she made no such offer. All she said was that she would try not to let her cheating make me ashamed of her. So why even ask that question? Mimi, are you willing to sign an agreement that you won't cheat and give up your half if you do? No, it wouldn't be cheating anyway. It was cheating at the picnic, Jerry blushed. Nellie said, I don't see any way out of it. I'll inform the judge that the parties can't come to an agreement. If he agrees, the divorce will go through. There is also the matter of custody. That is not my area of expertise. But I assume you both want to be the primary custodians. They both nodded. Mimi said, I guess I'll get that right since I'm the mother. Nellie made a grimace. Perhaps, but Mimi, it seems that your insistence on having sex outside of marriage is the reason for the divorce. The judge probably won't like that. Jerry watched this exchange of opinions. He was interested in Mimi's reaction. My attorney said the mother usually gets primary custody and can stay in the house. Have you told her you're going to insist on having sex outside of marriage? No, not yet. Here's the thing. Please let her know that and see what she says back. That is, if losing primary custody will change the way you feel about it, we can come back next week. At the next meeting, Mimi was cheered up. She talked to her attorney about getting a hall pass. The lawyer showed no enthusiasm. Nellie asked, Mimi? What's your news on custody, given your position on adultery? Not very good news. I may not get custody. I may have to pay child support. It was uncertain. If I didn't get custody, I'd be out of the house. So, are you ready to give up your need for extramarital sex? Yes, I am ready to resume my marriage as it was and not seek other partners. Jerry, would you be willing to do that? Jerry thought for a moment. I love Mimi and think she is a good mother, but I don't believe what she says about fidelity. If she will sign the agreement you mentioned, I might give it a try. I don't want any agreement. I don't believe we need one. Except for that one time, we don't need one. And that wasn't real sex. Jerry said, it seemed real to me. Nellie asked Mimi, do you understand why Jerry might want to make an agreement? I understand but it makes me feel like he sees me as a total slut. But Mimi, you repeatedly told Jerry and me that you wanted sex outside the house. 
It wasn't until the lawyer questioned custody that you gave in. Without the agreement, Jerry would just go back to the way things were when you were fiddling with Blake. If you cheated and got caught, he'd be back to square one. Why should he put up with that? That's the thing. He can put some kind of tracker on my phone, monitor my car or something, but I'm not going to make an agreement. Jerry? She'll just try to get around the system. She wants other men, and that's what she'll try to accomplish. If there's no post nup, there won't be a marriage. I don't think I'm being unreasonable. Remember, she said I'd never feel any different if she had another guy every now and then. He still doesn't believe in me. She turned to Jerry. Jerry, I'm sorry I fooled around behind your back. And I'm sorry for having those urges. I won't lie about it. In six years, our children will be off to college. I agree to be faithful for those six years. After that, all bets are off. Jerry was puzzled. Six years. Did he believe her? You'll sign a prenup for six years? Yes. Bert, if you get me to sign, we'll have all the odds after six years. If you don't, we probably won't. I'll only give up the divorce if you sign. If you want to sign after the kids go to school, we have to agree on the division of property beforehand. Nellie sent the notes from the meeting to the lawyers. An agreement was reached. The agreement was for six years or until their youngest child turned 18. It stated that if Mimi had sexual contact with a stranger, she would relinquish custody and take only $20,000 and her retirement account as compensation in the divorce. There was no property division clause after six years. Jerry went back upstairs. It had been two months since he had slept with his wife. Their first night together had started awkwardly. Neither of them knew how to approach it. But after a few tentative kisses, Jerry decided to fuck Mimi hard. For the next few months, Jerry slept with Mimi four or five times a week. She was enjoying all of this. She no longer loved Jerry as much as she used to but she was completely satisfied with her marriage. Jerry, for his part, was no longer eager to make love to Mimi. Look where it got him. He began to think of her as a good whore. She really was a good whore. She always responded. Their kids complained that they were making too much noise. Mimi told them to get over it. The sex went on for all six years. Of course, it wasn't always as intense as it had been in the first few months after the divorce but both Mimi and Jerry were always satisfied, more than satisfied. In those six years, Jerry had never once made sweet love to Mimi. He'd never felt like doing it. They had jobs and children. Jerry went to the gym and played tennis. Mimi sewed and loved to take long walks after class was over. She never once got lost, and neither did Jerry. But they weren't as close as they used to be. They used to have long discussions about books or politics. Now they had family life, sex, and work. Each of them was doing well in his own business. Jerry was a top salesman and was saving a little money. In light of a possible impending breakup, he had set aside a decent amount. Mimi worked as a full-time teacher at the school and earned just enough to support herself if necessary. She was also contemplating what might happen when Winifred left for school. They were both 41 years old. The day came when Winifred was sent to the state. Mimi and Jerry sadly saw her off. Mimi felt the loss especially keenly. Winnie graduated first in her class. She had a full academic scholarship. George, as a tennis player, received a half scholarship. He, too, attended a state university. When they dropped Winnie off, the four of them enjoyed dinner. Then everyone hugged each other, and Mimi and Jerry drove toward the house that had been their family hearth for 20 years. On the way, they hardly spoke at all. When they got home, it was past 11. They went straight upstairs, brushed their teeth, and changed into their night clothes. It was warm, and the night clothes consisted of boxers for Jerry and a short sleeveless cotton sleeping dress for Mimi. They settled into bed. At the same moment, they turned and looked at each other. Jerry said, I love you, Mimi. Always have. Mimi wept and hugged him. I love you, too. No matter what happened before, I will always love you. They made sweet love. She loved it too.